So we, here in the United States, kind of, are, we're kind of set apart, aren't we? Right? We're kind of like God's people. We are God's people, and especially those of us that know Christ. All right? Isn't that neat? So when you think about rules, <coughs> know that they come from a place of what? Love. Okay? And that the person giving the rules gives them because he loves you. <coughs> he expects the very best from you, and you are to be set apart. <coughs> And the two ones you really want to focus on, love God and love others. Okay? If you do those two things, the rest will fall into place. Good? All right. Now, stand up. We're going to do something a little bit different today than singing. What I have here are your Ten Commandments. Okay? In a little bit of an easier way than the thou's and the thighs and the shout knots. Okay? So what I would like for y'all to do is nice and loud so everybody can hear you. I would like for you to read these Ten Commandments. Okay? Alright, I'll start you off. Number one. Don't worship any other God. Say it with me. Number two. Don't make anything in your life more important than God. Number three. Don't use God's name in a bad way. Number four. Rest one day a week. Number five. Obey your parents. I like that one. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> Don't kill. Number seven. Be faithful to your family. Number eight. Don't steal. Nine. Don't lie. Ten. Don't be greedy. Got it? <laughs> Got it. All right. Oh, you keep it. You keep it. Right. Why didn't they hand those out to my kids? <laughs> <laughs> well, the lecture reading this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, the second chapter, uh, beginning at verse 13. And uh, it's interesting the way the Gospels are arranged. In the, in the other Gospels, this particular incident takes place towards the end of Jesus' ministry. In John's Gospel, it takes place during the, the first part of Jesus' ministry. So, one of the problems that, that uh, the New Testament writers had was trying to figure out the timelines of, uh, of when things actually happened. And so, it was really kind of left up to the writers when they figured out for themselves where to place the different stories of Jesus. Um, the, uh, the initial stories of Jesus were written by accountants. Most people don't know that. They weren't written by, uh, by theologians, and they weren't written by the disciples themselves. They were written by accountants, and they were written the way accountants write. No disrespect. But uh, the, it would go something like, because these were the only people who were writing other than the religious scribes, which uh, weren't going to write these things down. But the people who converted to Christianity, a lot of them were business people, and so they would say to a disciple, well, tell me something that Jesus said. And he said, well, he said this, so they'd write it down. And then, well, what's, the, what's another thing that Jesus said? Write it down but they didn't have a sense of context of when these things were. And so these were what we call codex. They were written uh, on both sides of the page, economically, like accountants would, instead of on scrolls. And so we don't have the same timelines for, this, for the Gospels. That's one of the reasons why things are kind of scrambled as they're presented to you in the New Testament. But this, in John, takes place towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's his visit to the temple. <coughs> The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and dove, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for my house will consume me. 
The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Hmm. It's taking them 46 years to build the temple, and it wasn't finished yet. I guess they didn't have a good project manager. <clears throat> So, Jesus goes to the temple, and he sees all of this stuff going on. We've talked about this previously. He has seen all these things going on where they're buying and selling on the temple steps. And the reason for this was that, uh, and this came out of the Deuteronomic laws that we've been studying, uh, people would have to go to the temple in order to make a sacrifice. Well, you might not live in Jerusalem, you might live someplace out of town. You might live up near Lebanon, or you might live uh, down near the Dead Sea. And, uh, and trying to drag a sheep that far was tough. I mean, your sheep was supposed to be in perfect condition when you offered it for sacrifice. And if I had dragged the sheep all the way from Lebanon, neither the sheep nor I would be in perfect condition. So, in order to simplify things, you could sell your sheep in Lebanon, go to Jerusalem, and buy a sheep in Jerusalem. The only problem was that the price for a sheep in Jerusalem wasn't exactly the price of a sheep in Lebanon. If you're going to present something to the temple, it had to be grade A certified, and the priest had to approve of that sacrifice. And so you had all these sheep that were certified, <coughs> and you had licensed vendors who then would provide a certain amount back to the priesthood after they had sold the sheep at an inflated price. Also, if you were going to pay the temple tax, you had to pay it in shekels. You could not pay the temple tax with a Roman or Greek coin. You had to use a Jewish coin, so it had to be paid in shekels. Well, if you're up in Lebanon, or you're near uh, Syria, or you're uh, down near Egypt, you might not have access to Jewish coins. You might just have Roman coins, or Greek coins, or whatever coins there were floating around out there. And so you'd have to take your coins and bring them to the money changers, and then there was an exchange rate. And those of you who have traveled internationally know something about exchange rates. Sometimes they're really good, and sometimes they really stink. And the ones on the temple steps didn't smell so good. They were inflated. And so what was happening was that this marketing was going on and it became the business of religion. It became the business of religion. And so often what has happened with really any institution, but with religious institutions especially, is that they turn into a business. They turn into a business. Now, I was raised in a very evangelical church, and one of, the, one of the problems that we had because of this very story was, how do you do a fundraiser for the church? Well, they wanted to rely strictly on tithes and offerings. They didn't want to do fundraisers. I can't remember having a fundraiser except an appeal, just an appeal, for offerings for a building project or anything else. We didn't go out and sell barbecue plates or anything like that because there was a prohibition generally in that denomination, that we were not going to turn our religion into a business. I remember, however, <clears throat> when we went to camp meetings, and we had the great tabernacle on the campgrounds, and everybody came to the tabernacle for the evangelists to preach, uh, that invariably the publishing house of that denomination had a huge display in the back of the tabernacle. So that, just on the way out, you may not miss an opportunity to purchase that book. And there were just myriads of books written by evangelists. 
and who just happened to be preaching that day, who might be hawking a book at the back of the tabernacle. And there was, it was like, oh, uh, are, we, are we going too far with this? Are we turning this into a business? Well, I want you to know that since I've become a Methodist, barbecue plates are a tradition. <laughs> we do not rail against barbecue plates on behalf of the church. I myself have helped to raise thousands of dollars for various projects in the church using uh, certified <laughs> chickens. <laughs> Where is the problem? Why is this a problem? Well, one of the things that you have in any religion is you're going to have some kind of financial need. And so, in this case, you had a building project. They've got to build the temple. Okay? There is also, if you remember our studies in Deuteronomy, that you had to support the Levites, and you had to support the priests. Okay? So... When they started out in Deuteronomy, there may not have been that many Levites, and, there were, and the priesthood, other than the Levitical priesthood, hadn't really been established. And, <clears throat> but, you know, families grow. And, uh, and so you had the situation where John the Baptist's dad was, uh, was a priest. But he couldn't be a priest uh, 360 days a year. He had to be a priest on a rotational basis. Okay, so you had all these priests coming in on a rotational basis, and you had to provide for their support when they came to Jerusalem to serve as priests. And then you had the Levites doing the same thing. They had to, had to come, and you know there was a rotational thing, and you had to support all those people. And so there were some heavy demands. And when you have heavy demands, you start scratching your head about what's theologically acceptable. And so they set up this business on the steps of the temple where they could use the sacrifices as a means of raising funds for the temple projects and staff. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it is this. If you wanted your sins to be forgiven, you had to provide a sacrifice. You had to. And so, if you have to, then people can start charging you whatever they want. Okay? We just went through this with a health care system. If you have to do it, then they can charge whatever they want. So your salvation is for sale. Your salvation is for sale. And you're not buying it from God. You're buying it from the vendors on the steps of the temple. Now, fast forward a little bit. Fast forward to the Protestant Reformation under Martin Luther. There were other reformations that were going on at the time, all over Europe. Martin Luther was not the first. But Martin Luther's movement became the primary movement for Protestantism. And what was he objecting to? Well, he was objecting to a lot of things. He had all these treatises that he nailed to the door of the, uh, of the cathedral. And uh, one of them had to do with indulgences. Now, this is what was going on in Martin Luther's day. Martin Luther went to Rome. He went to the head of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome where it was headquartered, and he saw this massive building project that was going on, which we know as St. Peter's. And the Roman Catholic Church needed to raise money to build St. Peter's. So they came up with 
a method where you could buy an indulgence at your local parish. And if you bought the indulgence, then your sins were forgiven. Which meant that if you were rich, your sins were forgiven because you could afford it. But if you were poor, you had to go through the ordinary stuff of going and confessing to a priest and all the rest. And Martin Luther says salvation should not be for sale. Salvation should not be for sale. So when we look at this, and the scripture that's quoted about Jesus says, uh, zeal for the temple will be, you know, will have zeal for the temple. Jesus didn't really have, I think, a lot of zeal for the temple. Jesus looked at it one time and said, in the not too distant future, this thing's going to be utterly destroyed. I mean, if he had real zeal for the temple, he would have overthrown the Roman Empire that destroyed the temple. He didn't have zeal for the temple. He had zeal for salvation. He had zeal for salvation. And he had zeal that God would not judge you based on your economic circumstances. God would judge you based on the sincerity of your heart. So in John's Gospel, at the very outset, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus has already declared war on the established religion. Jesus has already called them to task. Jesus is like one of the minor prophets, perhaps, in the latter part of the Old Testament, that railed against corruption. And it marked the character of his ministry. And they wanted to know, what sign do you have, or what authority do you have? Show us your credentials. You know, you walk into my office and I've got my elders' orders on the wall. And those are my credentials. I have the authority to stand behind this sacred desk. Well, sort of, at least it's a piece of paper that says I do. What are your credentials? Show us the sign. Where's your degree? Who are you coming down here from some Kodunk Galilean crossroad telling us how to conduct our business at the temple? And Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. There's a double meaning in that. Jesus, Jesus did double speak from time to time. The thing about double speak is it could mean one thing, or it could mean another. He said, destroy this temple, and they looked around at the building. But he was really talking about the temple of his body. And what he was daring them to do was to kill him. Try and kill him. And it won't stop him. That's a bold statement. Bold statement. And, you know, there are a lot of people who, when they look at the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus, they look at, at Jesus as being um, a godly man, uh, a man of love, a man who preached love, okay? But he had no problem in, uh, in calling out the scribes and the Pharisees for the hypocrites that they are and were. And for some of us to this day. He was, if he had not been confrontational, they would not have hung him on a cross. Understand that.
So what does this mean for us today? This means for us today that we should look at corruption the same way Jesus did. And the first place to root it out, the first place to root out corruption is in our churches. That's the first place. And we have to be very scrupulous about it. We really do. I love Jennifer's uh, children's sermon today about the Ten Commandments. We don't have just Ten Commandments in the United Methodist Church. We have a book of discipline. And it's that thick. And it's got rules all over the place in it. And do you know why they're in there? It's so that the United Methodist Church does not become a corrupt organization. That's why they're put in place. We are called Methodists because we are methodical. We're also Methodists because that was the term of ridicule that John Wesley's detractors used when they described it. We don't want our church to be corrupt. We will do everything. We will lean over backwards to make sure that there is not the slightest hint of corruption in our church. We want our church to have integrity. So that's the first place you look for corruption. And then you look for corruption generally in society. And one of the reasons why there are so many places in the world where the governments are totally corrupt is that the church has not used its power to examine that corruption and call it out. And they've done it. They've failed to do it out of fear. They have failed to do it out of fear. We have not, as Christians, gone to corrupt governments very often and said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. <laughs> if we are faithful Christians, we are enjoined by the Christ that we follow to call out corruption whenever we see it. Not just when we experience it, but when your neighbor experiences it. When your neighbor is oppressed, when your neighbor is canceled, when your neighbor is denied a job, because they tried to speak truth. We as a church cannot remain silent about it. Jesus said, Jesus didn't just say, Jesus took action against corruption. Now, in his day, there wasn't going to be any vote about how the temple was going to operate. Nobody was going to ask the population if they thought this was fair. Okay? That system was totally imposed. If there wasn't anything that the common people or anybody could say or do about the temple corruption. So Jesus protested. He protested. Why do you think they call us protestants? Because we protested. Okay? When we saw corruption in the dominant faith of the age, we protested. It is the character of Christianity to protest. It is one of the reasons why, as was stated earlier, the foundation of this country is rooted in Judeo-Christian ethics. Because we don't like corruption. And we don't like to see hypocrisy amongst our leaders. It's something that we as a people do not abide. Sometimes it's not easy for us as people to do much about it. But unlike Jesus in his day, 
in the church, we have a vote. And unlike Jesus in his day, when it comes to government, we have a vote. And not only do we have a vote, we have an opportunity to be engaged in an ongoing dialogue with those for whom we have voted. And to hold them to account. And to let them know of our displeasure of the way things are going on. We can do that. We're supposed to do that. It is not only our constitutional right, it is our legal and Christian duty to do so. So when we see the little sisters of the poor being persecuted by a massive government, that's our business. That's our business. When we see fellow Christians silenced on social media or in other places. That's our business. That's our business. And I don't have the power to resurrect myself after three days. But I can tell you that I do have the power to ensure that the truth be told. And it might take three or more days for it to finally come out. But the truth has to be told. The truth has to be told. So if we call ourselves Christians, and during this Lenten season, we see that Jesus was not, willing to, was not unwilling to put his life on the line. We as Christians, during this Lenten season, have to see, as part of our Christian obligation, to speak out against injustice and against corruption. And to make sure that everyone knows, as Jesus was trying to state in his actions on the temple steps, that we are all equal in the sight of God, and it doesn't matter how much money you've got in your pocket. That's what Christ calls us to, if we are to follow him. And from time to time, it means that we may have to pick up a cross in order to go on that journey. But that's who we are. And that's what we're about. And you may think that one person can't make that much of a difference. I don't know. When Martin Luther nailed those questions to the door of the cathedral, if he really thought that one guy was going to make all that much of a difference. But you can make a difference. And better than that, we can make a difference. And better than that, a whole bunch of other we's can make a difference. Until finally the people who are totally tone deaf get the message and start singing on tune. And you can do that in the church. You can do it at work. And you can even in this country, thank God, do it in your government. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the liberty that we enjoy. But we know that those liberties are being under attack right now. And we pray, Father, that you would help us as a Christian community to stand strong and not to be intimidated by the powers that be. Enable us always to look at ourselves first and make sure that we are right with you. Make sure that we have the right message. Make sure in our hearts that what we're doing is consistent with the will of God. And then with boldness to go out and to proclaim the gospel, to set the captives free, to stand for justice, and to make sure that others, because of our courage, are willing to stand with us. These things we ask in the name of Christ our risen Lord. Amen. Amen.
closing hymn is number 504, The Old Rugged Cross. Shall we stand as we sing? <laughs>